It's the Tom Hartman University Book Club. Today we're reading from the Tom Hartman Reader, and uh, this is from page 39, chapter titled, An Informed and Educated Electorate. Uh, the epigraph, the quote that opens the chapter, is from Thomas Jefferson. If a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. Whenever the people are well informed, however, they can be trusted with their own government. That whenever things get so far wrong as to attract their notice, they may be relied upon to set them right. Into the article, into the chapter. Talk Radio News Service, based in Washington, D.C., is owned and run by my dear friend Ellen Ratner. Ellen is an experienced and accomplished journalist, and a large number of interns and young journalism school graduates get their feet wet in reporting by working for her. In March 2010, I was in Washington for a meeting with a group of senators, and I needed a studio from which to do my radio and TV show. Ellen was gracious enough to offer me hers. I arrived as three of her interns were producing a panel discussion type of TV show for web distribution at uh, talkmedianews.com, in which they were discussing for their viewing audience their recent appearances on Capitol Hill. Experiences, excuse me, on Capitol Hill. One intern panelist related that a White House correspondent for one of the big three TV networks had told her that the network registered a huge amount of interest in the hot story that week of a congressman's sexual indiscretions. Far less popular were stories about the debates on health care, the conflicts in the Middle East, and even the Americans who had died recently in Iraq or Afghanistan. The intern said, so that's the story they have to run with on the news, relating the substance of the network's correspondence thoughts, because that's what the American people want to see. If the network doesn't give people what they want to see, viewers will tune away and the network won't have any viewers, ratings, or revenues. The other two interns commiserated with the first about what a shame it was that Americans wanted the titillating stories instead of the substantive ones, but they accepted without question that the network was therefore obliged to, quote, give people what they want, end quote. When they finished their panel discussion, I asked these college students if they knew that there was a time in the United States when radio and TV stations and news broad networks broadcast the actual news instead of infotainment because the law required them to. None of them had any idea what I was talking about. But the reality is that from the 1920s, when radio really started going big in the United States, until Reagan rolled it back in 1987, federal communications law required a certain amount of public service programming from radio and television stations as a condition of retaining their broadcast licenses. The agreement was basic and simple. In exchange for the media owners being granted a license from the Federal Communications Commission to use their airwaves, owned by the public, they had to serve the public interest first, and only then could they go about the business of making money. If they didn't do so, when it came time to renew their license, public groups and individuals could show up at public hearings on the license renewal and argue for the licenses being denied. One small way that stations lived up to their public service mandate was by airing public service announcements for local nonprofit groups, community calendars, and other charitable causes. They also had to abide by something called the Fairness Doctrine, which required them to air diverse viewpoints on controversial issues. Separately, during election campaigns, broadcasters had to abide by the Equal Time Rule, which required them to provide equal airtime to rival candidates in any election. But the biggest way that they proved that they were providing a public service and meeting the requirements of the Fairness Doctrine was by broadcasting the news, real news, actual news, local, national, and international news produced by professional old-school journalists. Because the news didn't draw huge ratings like entertainment shows, although tens of, Amer of millions of Americans did watch it every night on TV and listen to it at the top of every hour on radio from coast to coast, and because real news was expensive to produce, with bureaus and correspondents all over the world, News was a money loser for all of the big three TV networks and for most local and radio uh, and national radio TV, uh, radio t and TV stations. But it was such a sacred thing. This was, after all, the keystone that held together the station's license to broadcast and thus to do business. It didn't matter if it lost money. It made all the other money-making things possible. Through much of the early 1970s, I worked in the newsroom of a radio station in Lansing, Michigan. It had been started and was then run by three local guys, an engineer, a salesman, and a radio broadcaster. They split up the responsibilities like you expect, and all were around the building most days and would hang out from time to time with the on-air crew, all except the sales guy. I was forbidden from talking with him because I worked in news. There could be no hint, ever, anywhere, that our radio station had violated the FCC's programming in the public interest mandate by, for example, by going easy on an advertiser in a news story or promoting another advertiser in a different story. 
News had to be news, separate from profits and revenue. If it wasn't, I'd be fired on the spot. News, in other words, wasn't part of the free market. It was part of our nation's intellectual commons, and thus the price of the station's license. After Reagan blew up the Fairness Doctrine in 1987, two very interesting things happened. The first was the rise of right-wing hate speech talk radio, starting with Rush Limbaugh that very year. The second, which really stepped up after President Bill Clinton signed the Telecommunications Act of 96, was that the money-losing news divisions of the big three television networks were taken under the wings of their entertainment divisions and wrung dry. Foreign bureaus were closed, reporters were fired, stories that promoted the wonders of advertisers owned by the same mega corporations began to appear, and investigative journalism began to die. It's the Tom Hartman Reader. <laughs>